It was only a, a few days after his death. The funeral was over. We had tended to the business of dying. Friends had returned to their lives and family had gone back to work. It was time to get on with life. But I wasn't quite sure how to do that. I had never before experienced the death of someone so close to me. My grandfather had been like a second father. He was smart and strong and dependable. He had always been there for me, always, no matter what. And I loved him. I admired him. He was my hero. How was I supposed to live without him? We had known that his death was imminent. But you're never really ready to say goodbye. I did not handle it well. I got angry. I got angry at everything everybody said and did. I mean, when my beloved Aunt Dorothy began to put away all of my granddaddy's things, well, I just lost it. I mean, how dare she remove his can of peanuts from the t kitchen table? And I got so mad that I had to leave the house. I even threatened to boycott the funeral. But of course, I went. I even read scripture. Though for the life of me, I couldn't tell you what passage I selected. I don't remember much about the funeral at all. Except that I got mad about something stupid the preacher said. But I went, and I held my tongue, and I held on to my grandmother. And we got through it together. But now I was back at home. Alone. And it was a jolt to see that for everyone else, everything was the same. The world kept turning. For everyone else, it was business as usual. For me, nothing was the same. It would never be the same again. I wasn't sure what to do with myself. So I decided to go for a walk. Back then I was living in Brownsville, Tennessee, and it was a gorgeous day in early spring. I had walked for a couple of miles and was making my way back home when I heard a familiar rumbling coming up the road from behind me. I turned and sure enough, there it was, an old Ford tractor just like the one my grandfather used to drive. It was red with white trim. And behind the wheel sat an elderly man wearing an ancient long sleeve cotton shirt that had been washed so many times it was almost threadbare. I knew that shirt. I knew the hat. It was a straw hat with a wide brim and it was pulled down low for to take to protect his ears from the sun. I knew the man grinning at me from under that hat. It was my grandfather, or someone who looked an awful lot like him. I stood with my mouth just hanging open as the tractor slowly made its way up the street, turned a corner and disappeared from sight. Now I knew, even as I stood there, that there was no way that that could be my grandfather. He had died. We had buried him. I had seen his lifeless body with my own two eyes. I knew he was gone. I wasn't crazy. But I also knew that I had lived in that town for two years. And I had never before seen that tractor or that man. But there they were that day, making their way down Park Street just when I needed them most. Now, I don't know if I saw a vision or if there really was an old man on an old Ford tractor driving through town that day. But I will always believe that God used that moment to send me a message. And the sight of that fellow on a tractor told me that I was not alone. The past was not forgotten. And in some mysterious way, my grandfather was still with me. He is still with me. He comes to see me in my dreams every now and then. Now, he never speaks, 
He just gives a mischievous grin and lets me know that everything is okay. Now, grief is a powerful emotion and everyone experiences it differently. Sometimes we want so badly to see our loved ones again that our minds conjure them up. We may see them in a dream or in the people around us. So it's really not surprising that the first followers of Jesus were, you know, a bit skeptical when they began to hear reports that our Lord had been raised from the dead. I mean, seriously, people don't just get up from their graves and start walking around. And there was no doubt in any of their minds that Jesus was dead. They'd been there. At a distance, sure, but they knew for a fact that Jesus had been beaten, tortured, and hung on a cross to die. They had heard Jesus call out to the women, Don't weep for me. And they had heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. They had heard him assure one of the criminals, Today you will be with me in paradise. And they had heard when Jesus used his last breath to cry out to God, Into your hands I commend my spirit. So there was no doubt that Jesus was dead. His lifeless body had been wrapped in a linen cloth and laid inside a tomb. Jesus had been dead for days. There was no coming back for that. So the eleven and their companions were understandably skeptical when the women showed up that morning saying that Jesus was alive. But then they got word that Simon had seen the risen Lord. And then in walks Cleopas and his friend with the astounding news that Jesus had come to see them while they were traveling to Emmaus. Now don't you know that that prompted much discussion? Simon and Cleopas probably had to tell their tales a hundred times or more. The disciples listened for details, trying to find a crack in the story. I bet there was a lot of speculation, excitement, disbelief. But also, somewhere inside, I bet you there was a growing flame of hope. And could it be? Could it really be? And suddenly, there in the midst of them, Jesus appears. Do not be afraid, he says. Peace be with you. But they were afraid. They were terrified. They thought that they were seeing a ghost because dead men did not get up and walk around. And Jesus asks, why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See the proof. Touch me and see. Now everybody knows that a ghost does not have flesh and bones. But the resurrected Lord did. And the hearts of the disciples flooded with joy. The Lord was with them. And they desperately wanted it to be true, but it was just so hard to believe. People do not come back from the dead. I mean, dead was dead. But here was Jesus with them, right in front of their eyes. Have you anything to eat? he asked. They offered him fish, and Jesus ate it right in front of them. That ghost doesn't eat, but the resurrected Lord did. What did it all mean? Well, in the early first century, a group called the Gnostics believed, denied that humanity of Jesus because they believed that the body is evil and a holy God could not inhabit a sinful vessel. I mean, that's what they thought. They refused to believe that Jesus lived a human life, so he could not have died a physical death. So they sure didn't believe he had returned to a physical life. Instead, Gnostics believed that death simply freed the spirit from the prison of a physical body. 
And it's easy to see why people, even today, can fall into this way of thinking. I mean, disease, injury, addiction, any sort of physical limitation seems to hold us back, make us captive even. While our minds and our spirits are free to explore the ends of the universe. Well, Luke's gospel addresses this issue. The eyewitness accounts that are given stress the physical resurrection of our Lord. The physical resurrection of his body. Look at my hands and feet, Jesus tells the disciples. Touch me and see if it really is me. See, a ghost does not have flesh and bones, but I do. It really is me. I am alive. I was once truly dead, but now I am really alive. And to prove his point, Jesus asked them for something to, something to eat. And when they offer him a piece of broiled fish, he eats it right in front of them. Luke leaves no room for doubt. The body of Christ was raised from the dead. The body of Christ was raised to new life. The body of Christ was raised to life, but it was not a return to the old life. There was something new, something different about the risen Lord. I mean, friends and followers might recognize the resurrected Christ, but not immediately. He was not immediately recognizable to them. His appearance seems to have been somewhat altered, although we don't know how. And Jesus was also able to appear and vanish whenever he wanted to. But again, Scripture does not give us any details about that. We don't know if he mysteriously appeared before them or if someone opening a door and letting him in the room was such a mundane detail that they simply left it out of the story. But scripture makes it very clear that the body of Jesus had been raised from the dead. This was not simply a resuscitation of the former physical body of Jesus. This was an entirely new form of existence. But while it was something new, it was nothing to fear. It was still the same Jesus, the same Lord, the, the one who offered peace, the one who offered forgiveness, the one who offered love, the one who gives us hope. He, Jesus changed life and death. Death is no longer anything to fear. I mean, sure, the process of dying may not be anything to relish. It can be painful and humiliating. But even in those moments, we can draw comfort in knowing that Jesus has been there too. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to suffer and die. That Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose up from the grave to live again, to live victorious, to live a new life, a better life. A life that will never again know disease. A life that will never again know suffering. A life that will never again know sorrow. Because Jesus lived and died and rose again, the whole world would forever be different. Because he lived and died and rose again, we can too. Our bodies can be raised up in glory. We can also live a victorious life, a new life, a better life, a life that's free from any encumbrance, no disease, no suffering, no sorrow. And that's what awaits those who follow Jesus to the grave and beyond. Now, when those first disciples realized that Jesus had truly been raised from the dead, they were filled with joy and hope and courage. And they were unstoppable. Nothing, nothing could keep them from sharing the good news of God's amazing triumph over sin and death and despair. A Greek intellectual named Celsus would go on to write, these Christians preach and truly believe that they will rise again after death. 
And it's on the basis of that belief that they face death with an almost incredible obstinacy. <laughs> stubbornness. They face death with stubbornness. The encountering the risen Lord gave those first disciples the courage and the hope and the determination to proclaim the gospel no matter what the consequences might be. They no longer lived in fear of death. They would not cower in the darkness or run from adversity. Their very lives were a testament, a witness to the power of the resurrection. Now that does not mean that they were voluntarily jumping into the Colosseum to wrestle with wild animals. I mean, this body is a gift, a precious vessel. God expects us to take good care of it. And remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? The devil had not been able to trick Jesus into using his power for selfish purposes or to feed his own ego. So the wily one tries to convince Jesus to throw himself off the highest peak of the temple roof. I mean, the scripture says God will take care of you, right? And what did Jesus say? Luke chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus says, Do not put the Lord to the test. God will take care of us. But we do not honor the Lord by taking unnecessary risks with our health and safety. We care for this body so that we can do the work God has called us to do. And it's possible that in the course of doing ministry, our lives, our, our bodies may be put in harm's way. I mean, this last year, countless teachers and healthcare workers and food service employees and truck drivers and scientists and preachers, they have put themselves at risk so that they can do the work God has called them to do in the midst of a global pandemic. Others put their lives on the line for us every day. I mean, it's been almost 20 years, but I will never forget the day that the towers fell in New York City. All those people were running from those towers that were burning and crumbling and on the verge of collapse. But the firefighters and the police were going in. Father Michael Judge went with them. Nothing was going to keep him from sharing God's love with the people in that tower. See, that's what it means to believe in the resurrection of the body. Because the body of our Lord was raised to live a new life, a better life. Then there's no reason for us to fear death. There's no reason for us to be afraid of what other people are going to think about us or do to us. I mean, living for Jesus can be dangerous. Like turning the other cheek, forgiving 70 times 7, I mean, hanging out with sick people, well, that stuff can get you killed or laughed at or abandoned. But the resurrection of the body means that God can take the very worst thing that can possibly happen and bring forth something Good, something beautiful, something new. God can take death and bring forth everlasting life.